OK, I have a lot of slides to get through, so I'm just going to start. If you have questions, please hold them off till the end. There's two slides that ask, that query for questions. Do you hear that? I just said query for questions. That's cool. <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm here to talk about Beehive. And it's the first part of the talk is going to go by kind of fast. And you'll probably go, what am I actually listening to? That's OK, because the second part of the talk, hopefully, I'll reveal that. Um, just have to get through the first stuff. So uh, just to get started, Beehive Scalable Application Deployment by Ari Lerner. Who is Ari Lerner? That would be uh, me. Um, oh, boy. OK, so I'm a lead software engineer at at and Interactive in Glendale, California. Um, I'm soon to be an innovation coach at at and On Wednesday, I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, um, or SF Bay Area, and I will be um, having a new jab. So, ah, woo. Um, OK, so I've been working with Ruby since 2004. Oh, man, it's getting lower and lower. Um, I've been working with Rails since 2005. Uh, I haven't done Rails in about a year, though. Um, I work primarily right now. <laughs> I work primarily right now in distributed computing um, and systems and deployment at AT&T Interactive. I have a totally rad Mini Cooper, and sadly it's not this one, because that's a really rad Mini Cooper. And I also have a totally rad dog. Um, tell, don't tell me when I have that, because that's child porn. She's only three. OK. Um, I do a lot of open source. I primarily only work in open source. Um, you can see all my open source stuff at GitHub slash a user. A user is my name everywhere, except for here. I'm Ari Lerner. Um, these are just some examples of some of my uh, open source work. You, like I said, you can, you can check it out there. Um, so less about me and more about what I'm actually going to talk about today, which is Beehive, which the subtitle is Scalable Application Deployment, as um, the program suggested. So what is it? <laughs> At the top. <laughs> oh, man. OK. Uh, raise your hand if you can't deal with the resolution problems. All right, so uh, what is it? O Beehive is an open source solution to complex application deployment stacks. It's fault tolerant. It's application agnostic. We'll get into that later. Uh, it's natively scalable, event driven, which is important. Another point that we'll touch on in a little while. It's multi-tenant. Oh, I already said scalable. Um, it has intelligent routing. It's a deployment system. I'm going to clear that up. It's a deployment system. It's not a Ruby framework. It's not a Ruby library. It's a deployment system. I'm at a Ruby conference, so I should say that. It's also totally MIT licensed and free. And like I said before, it's open source. Um, it's tested. We're using it in internal production at at and Interactive. It's extensible. I'll show, you, I'll show you how in a little while. Distributed, written in Ruby, Bash, C, and Erlang, primarily in Erlang. And there are three at and Interactive de uh, developers on it, as well as open source collaborators on the web, notably one guy in Argentina. Um, so that was a whole bunch of buzzwords, am I right? So what actually is it? Uh, <laughs> uh, Beehive is a tool that enables developers to deploy, manage, and manage their own applications in a scalable, multi-tenant environment without having to deal with deployment. Huh? OK, so basically, it's just an active intelligent routing mesh. That's a lot easier to understand, huh? So why do we do this? Why even add change? Well, because deployment today is really rough, I think. It centers around the server, requires lots of resources, people resources, um, computer resources. We, most of the time, you end up deploying one application to one computer. So 99.9% .9 of the time, that computer is doing nothing, unless, if, unless it's an AM Hadoop mesh, in which case 88% of the time, it's not doing anything. Um, and also, the other problem with deployment is today is that there's, you have to deal with like scheduled releases. We're not going to deploy until Thursday at 2 AM. Then you have to stay up till Thursday at 2 AM. Of course, that means you have to stay up until Thursday or Friday at like 12 or 1 PM, just because you always have to deal with problems that happen. And, Etc. So really, I'm a developer. I'm not a deployment person. Well, that's not entirely true anymore for me. But most of the time, or what I want to deal with is only development. I don't want to deal with deployment. So deployment, or de deployment today does not focus on the application, nor does it focus on the developer, nor on this really sad looking lady. Um, so I suggest we have an application revolution. Let is, let's focus on the application. Let, let the. <laughs> Let the server managers manage the servers, and let the developers develop. So um, because we're writing this, what do we want it to do? 
we want to make we want to make it easy to deploy rapidly. So when you add a change and it's all, all your continuous integration server stuff passes, you want to be able to uh, deploy it right there. Why wait? Um, so it enables Beehive enables rapid deployment. We want it to be able to do that. It's also built to scale. So your application becomes like Twitter, and boom, people in Ethiopia are using it to uh, escape their freedom issues that are going on. Actually, Ethiopia has pretty good freedom issues. They're pretty free press. What's a better one? I Iran. Yeah, so like Iran, or people in, in Iran are using it to say how poor they live right now in their environment, in their political environment. So all of a sudden, your application needs to scale. So let's build this deployment solution to scale. It also handles failures pretty gracefully. Um, probably not graceful that I use the Twitter fail well, but it's OK. Anyway, so um, another thing, don't want to use any new tools. I don't want to have to teach my developers anything. Not that I have developers, but it'd be cool if I did. But I don't, as a developer, want to learn anything new and add to my current framework. So um, for us at at and Interactive, we like to use git push. Um, you can also use pure HTTP with Beehive because there's a pure HTTP server in there. So most of the examples I'll go over with today will be using um, pure HTTP, which is curl in our case. Um, however, there is a Ruby gem in development. It's actually checked in in the source code. So if you want to add to it um, and you don't know Erlang or C or Bash, um, you can add to it there. Um, or if you like Python. I don't know why you'd be at a Ruby conference if you like Python, but you could just write one in Python. Or you could write an HTTP client in Python. Um, oh, that's another thing. We use HTTP. It's been around for a long time. Why change it? Um, OK, so how do we work with Beehive? Well, first you have to define an app. Um, the way you do that is, oh, God. Um, the way you do that is you use a curl request or soon the Beehive gem. Um, to create an application, and that basically takes your fancy triangle-like application that you can't see here and puts it into the um, yellow curvy uh, rectangle over there, which I represent as Beehive, and then you're set. So how do you deploy an application? Well, um, use either a git post commit hook, which is what we use at at and Interactive, or you just do a curl request, and you hit uh, Beehive with that, uh, like this curl request. Can you guys all read that? OK, awesome. Am I, ta am I like drone talking? Should I spice it up? Is this good? OK, let me know. <laughs> OK, so what does Beehive do then? Well, Beehive will, if it has not already checked it out, um, it will check out and bundle the application. I'll go over what that means in like 10 seconds. Um, and it'll also check for errors. Uh, every stage, by the way, it checks for errors. So if it, if it can't bundle, if it can't clone it for some reason, your pu public key isn't there, um, it won't be able to clone it. It'll fail. It'll let you know. Uh, if it can't bundle it for some odd reason, uh, like you can't find a dependency, then it will let you know. Uh, it will try to start the application. If that fails, it will let you know. It's um, pretty communicative as a framework or as a uh, tool itself. Um, and it will try to start the application. And then it will take, remember I said it was uh, an intelligent router? So all the requests that come into the router are held for a specific amount of time, a timeout. Um, when this, when I call them bees, when the bees start up, then that router will say, OK, now I can start routing requests to that application or that bee, if you will. Um, and so, once again, uh, this you can't really see it here, but it's a square app that represents a bee. You're putting it into the um, round-ish rectangle that represents Beehive over here. OK, and then you're ready. Oh, that looks good. <laughs> then you're ready to go. <laughs> OK, so what did that do? That took our deployment time from scheduled releases on Thursday at 2 AM, where we have to actually stay up till like Friday at 1 PM to finish that release to seconds. And um, if there is a problem on the server, it will let you know. Oh, ah, I should, ooh, I'll take a step back real quick. If uh, your application is already running and you're deploying a new feature, and then for some reason you forgot to check it into continuous integration, and your continuous integration server fails, and then your application goes up, but there's a problem, it can't start your application, then it won't start rerouting new requests to the new application. So your old application will stay up. So it's 99.9 .9 times 10 nines of uptime, because there is that slight chance that the application, actually, no, there's no chance. I lied. I totally, completely lied. There's 100% uptime when you update an application, because if it can't start, it won't start. OK. So it take, to finish this slide, it um, takes your deployment time from minutes, hours, months, to uh, seconds. Um, so like I alluded to before, what happens if an HTTP request comes in while you're deploying an app that isn't up? The router 
the, the distributed router in BI will hold that request until it can start an application. As I said before, my representation for apps are Bs, so I'll probably just use that for now on. Um, Bs represent a running application. That's why it's called Beehive, because there's lots of Bs in the Beehive. And the router is kind of like the queen. OK. <laughs> um, so you're, this, the HTTP request that comes in, say, I'm Bob, and I'm trying to hit my application at getbeehive.beehive.com, or whatever I call it. Um, and my application, con or, I'm sorry, me connects to the application through the router, which turns into a proxy. Um, then that proxy will be shoved off of the router and handled in its own process. Erlang is really nice at process handling, process management, so the router totally forgets it. So the only time your router is actually engaged is when there's an active request coming in that has not been connected to a backend B. Okay, so if thousands of requests come in in a second, like let's say Iran, all of a sudden their government is overthrown. I probably shouldn't use Iran, should I? It's like a political hotbed. I'll say, oh, ah, I'll say it anyway. Um, <laughs> say like the current government in Iran is overthrown and there's protests in the street and everyone's trying to, um, we'll say your application is called Twit, because it's not tweet, Twitter, it's just Twit. And everyone does like post the Twit to your <laughs> server and then all of a sudden you have like a million requests coming in at the same time. Beehive, because it knows how many requests are coming into every single application, it can spawn new applications seamlessly. You don't, as a developer, even have to deal with it because it's not dealt, it's not on the application, it's on the router, it's outside your application. That's, I think that's really cool. I don't have to deal with it. So notes about the proxy real quick, because um, I'm definitely going slower than I need to be. Um, the, the router acts as a proxy, like I said, if anything happens, or I'm sorry, uh, like I said before, like uh, Bob is here and Twit is here, and they connect and then a new process is spawned off. One neat thing about that process that's spawned off is it al it's also spawned with a supervisor. In Erlang, a supervisor, w just its entire job is to watch this process. So if this process dies, something happens on the server side, say the router that you're working on, it's not distributed or it is distributed and one of the routers that you're working on goes down, that supervisor will restart, will restart this, the proxy that's connected to the two clients seamlessly. So if I'm connected to server A and there's a server B and server A goes down, server B already knows about my process so it will start restart the server and I as Bob will never know that Twit actually happened. Nothing happened on Twit to me. Except for it might experience some slowness if Twit's not running on server B or behind server B. Possibly. Um, it's, it's all, that's all done seamlessly and automatically by the way. You don't ever have to deal with that or set any settings. Um, as I said, the router holds requests until a given timeout if it can't reach the server. Um, if that timeout is reached, then the user sees an error because we don't want them waiting forever. Um, so what exactly is a B? Like I said before, it's, um, it's like a, I didn't say it before. A uh, B is a uh, single file containing everything the application needs to run. So this includes environments. This includes, like for instance, in Rack apps and Ruby apps, gems. Um, includes all the dependencies that you need to run. And it doesn't really look like that because it's just code, but um, I think that's kind of a fun, ab fun abstraction. Um, so really, what is it? Right now, currently, baked in, it's a tar archive. Um, so just, take, just imagine your app, and you tar your app, and then you compress it, take things out that you don't need. That's all a B is. Um, so what does that do? Why do we want it into a single application rather than dealing with um, check cloning out and just doing rsyncs and stuff like that? Well, it's super easy. It turns out it's super easy to pass one file around rather than pass a bunch of files around. It's, it's not rocket science, but I giggled when I said that, at least. OK, anyway, um, so this also allows for continuous deployment. And if you live in LA like I do, you see this all the time. So um, it's pretty fancy and fun. But if you live in Austin, you don't see this all the time. So, oh, you do? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, I'll rephrase. We see this all the time. Um, and it, it allows developers to see it even more, to realize it even more. So um, another thing this allows us to do at at t Interactive, we have tons and tons of applications. Um, so it allows us to take, the, take servers, server resources, bunch them together, and over-provision on those servers. So we have, we have um, application one through like 1,000. One through 1,000 are not running all at the same time because 500 through 999 is not running, of course, what 
application 1000 is still running for some reason. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it allows us to naturally reap those resources and use them for other applications that are in use. Um, one thing I didn't note on the slides is Beehive will terminate applications that don't see a request in a given amount of time um, or that are overusing the um, resources that, you, that would like kill the server. So it will naturally re reap those and save all your other applications from, pure, from instant death. Okay. Um, uh, what is this one? Oh, yeah, okay. The, that's the representation of reaping resources. <laughs> so, oh my god, one of the servers got on fire because a gigantic fireball hit it. Ah! <laughs> I'll, I, can, I can wait to the left. Okay, um, so um, what does Beehive do? Beehive, no, normally what you do if you're on a server and your, your application lights on fire, you'd use something like Monit and you'd restart it. But Beehive takes a different approach and says, okay, well, we don't have to deal with it because no requests are coming in. Or if there are requests coming in, restart the application. But we'll just let it die. Like, who cares if it dies? Um, that does represent a problem if you write your app and your app is poorly written and it dies all the time. Um, you may not want the user to see that, but Beehive will handle that seamlessly. Um, so that's the representation of letting that application go away. Oh, no, Canada's internet died. A, <laughs> the fuzzy one is Canada. Um, so that's okay as long as, because Beehive is distributed by default, um, as long as you have another server located somewhere else outside of Canada, Beehive will, your Beehive will still continue to function. So what, remember again I had that like list of reasons that we should do something like this? Well, it turns, it turns development with Beehive without Beehive into development with Beehive. So be development with Beehive is developer driven, uses shared virtualized resources, reduces application management overhead, um, allows you to re release pretty much whenever you want. It's agile and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's growing community already around it. Um, you can go to any one of these, these places. The IRC room is pretty active. Um, I'm also very loquacious, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, and there's, a, there's the Beehive uh, webpage that's currently up right now. Actually, I totally lied. This is an old screenshot, but okay. Anyway, so now remember I said there's two slides where questions. Any questions so far? You can think of that you don't mind talking. No. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm just, like I said before. This is copy. And, this um, presentation is supposed to be representative of copy and paste. So I'll show you exactly how you can use it. Um, so we'll do a server quick start. Of course, you have to get the code when you want to do it. So you can't just start it if the code's somewhere else. So go get the code. Um, if you want to start it in development mode, which enables, um, enables you to actually do stuff and change stuff on the fly when you're developing without having to do, without having to do any like, fancy release, develop, or release deployment, um, you can do this one. Or if you want to um, deploy it for real, you can do that um, from within the code base. So what are we doing when we, when we type all that? funky make stuff, right? We're Ruby. We don't do make. Um, OK, so it starts the following. What it does is it will start the distributed router, uh, the distributed database. In Erlang, it's known as Amnesia. Uh, it starts the distributed event manager, which is really key to Beehive. That's how um, Beehive knows about, um, that's how uh, Beehive, like all the diff distributed routers know about all the different connections is because it starts the event, the event machine. I'm sorry, the event manager. Um, I didn't really go over that. Maybe I'll go over it in a minute. We'll see. Um, and then also starts the HTTP-based uh, RESTful server where we're hitting all our curl stuff and storage management stuff, but that's boring. OK, um, this is in Erlang. If you've ever used Erlang, this is a neat little tool. It shows you everything that's running. So this is everything that's running when you type make rel. Um, a lot more stuff happens. If you're actually to hit this and keep this, it's called atmon. If you're to keep this running, you'll see a whole bunch of new PIDs prop popping up and stuff. It's really neat. Anyway, so let's we'll say you're a client. You, you're not actively developing on Beehive, or you don't want to develop on Beehive. Again, you've got to get the source, um, go build the gem, and install it. Or uh, soon, you'll just be able to do gem install Beehive. So basic usage. Ah. OK, so there's basic authentication right now. It's token-based authentication. So you have, to be in the you have to be in the system. You have to, un you have to be able to add a user. Um, so if you're running your Beehive, you have to be able to write an administrative interface. On top of that, add the user, and they're just fine. So it enables you to have like a sign up on a web page, for instance. And if you wanted to charge people for it, 
like developer hours, like your own developers or other people, then you'd have to make sure that they're signed up on your web page. So Beehive doesn't deal with any of that. So um, if you require a credit card to use your Beehive, then um, that's outside of the scope. But if you don't require, it doesn't matter. You can just add one as an as a administrative user. But it has basic ACLs. Anyway, so um, we'll, let's say we want to add a user. Um, the different levels, you'll notice like right here, um, there's levels. Uh, level one is administrator, and it goes down from there, or up from there. Down, up, two. Two is a base, is a is, if you don't specify that level, it's a two, so it's a regular user, so you can't do crazy things with other people's applications. That's safety. Um, oh, that was creepy, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's for safety. Um, okay, so this is how you'd add an application. Uh, I know it looks really gross to us Ruby users. Um, like I said, the Beehive, the, actually the Beehive create um, works in the Ruby gem. So if you did want to just use the Ruby gem, you wouldn't have to do this crazy application, or uh, crazy curl call. Um, but this also works if you're more comfortable with that. Um, so let's add an application that will fail. You can see that's one that will fail because uh, a user doesn't exist dot git on GitHub doesn't exist. That's why it's called doesn't exist. Um, we can, and if you try to start doesn't exist, Beehive will say, oh my god, it failed on the bundle step or on the clone step. Um, so then you can update it here. Just basic um, REST stuff. You can check what applications you have up there. Um, you have to pass a token in if you're checking a user's applications. You don't have to pass a token in if you're checking all the applications, which I realize is a um, security issue. Oh, actually, no, I totally lied. This is outdated. We changed that. Ha-ha. <laughs> I'm giving this today, aren't I? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so let's update. How would you update a running application? Well, you'd redeploy it. That's why there's deploy at the end of that. So let's say I go and add a yellow toolbar on the top of my stuff, and I want to see that reflected in Beehive. You hit that one curl request. It'll do everything. It'll do all the cloning, the checking out, try to start the app, and then um, move the requests over to the new app. Um, one thing is, is if you have users connected to your old app, they will not see the new app when they run, because that application will not die until those sockets go away, which is nifty. Right? OK. <laughs> um, I don't know why you'd want to delete an app, because I think Beehive is pretty much just a write an app and throw it up on Beehive. Um, but if you did want to delete an app and clean up some stuff, or let's say your user's credit card failed um, to process, or your developer credit card or whatever, um, you could just go through and delete the app. Although that happens when users are deleted anyway. So you could just delete that. OK, so um, some advanced fun, just show some neat advanced stuff. Um, remember I said before it was extensible? You guys remember that? I don't know, it was a long time ago. Um, it's extensible in the sense that it's application agnostic, and if you can write a deployment frame, if you can write deployment in Bash, you can add it to Beehive. So currently right now we support natively Rack and Rails apps that also do include Bundler, Isolate, and .gems files. Um, but let's say you wanted to write a Python app and you wanted to deploy it on there. I, I don't know anything about Python, so you'll have to, are they called apps in Python? OK. <laughs> um, say you wanted to deploy um, a Python app, you could write it if you could write it in Bash. Um, so app, app templates is what I'm getting to. Um, so let's just pretend for a second that Rails is, doesn't, I'm sorry, uh, Beehive doesn't support, what is this, a Ra Rails app? Uh, yeah, OK. So let's pretend for a second that Beehive doesn't support a Rack app. Um, we can write one like this, put it on your system, and then uh, there's the system, by the way. Beehive Home is whatever you want it to be. If it's nothing, then it'll just use the core Etsy Home or Etsy path. Um, and then update the running system. What's one really neat thing about Beehive is if you update the running system, it doesn't affect the uptime of the, of the system. That's one reason for cho I chose Erlang to write this in is because Erlang was written, it's one of two languages written for business use, and it's written for business use in the telecom industry that needs 99.99 times 9 x uptime. So um, if you update, if you're going to update Beehive, you never have to see it go down. You never have to restart or anything. Um, so what is an app template? There are six different, um, six different pieces of an application lifecycle. First, in, from within Beehive. There's the bundle step, like I said before, compress it into a single file, um, set up all the dependencies, and then compress. Oh, I said that backwards. Um, there's the mount step, where you actually take that B and you put it onto a server and start running it. Um, and then there's the start command, so like when Beehive needs to go, oh my god, I need to start an app because the other one lit on fire. Um, then the start command will be executed, and then stop is pretty much 
you know, stopping an app. Unmounting is cleaning up that code and clean up by, um, actually happens automatically, so you don't have to deal with that. Uh, okay, yeah, so this would be like the end of, this would be like if you were to add a, the, this is a bundle, a representation of a bundle um, step in Beehive. Um, yeah, so if you were to add this and then do that curl and update the system, then your system would be going and you wouldn't have to deal with any. Like then, then you could deploy Python apps or in this case, Rack apps. Okay, um, let's say you want to get the stats of your server. Um, this is like all, like how many people are running, like what's the usage, like what's the bandwidth usage. You can do this for different users. Um, let's say you want to get the, node, the nodes on the system. Say you have like 100 nodes and you want to get a specific node. You can get the specific node stats um, for ranges. It even supports ranges. I know, crazy, right? Okay, so um, real quick, some more advanced fun, fun just to show you how powerful Beehive actually is. You can add custom event handlers. Um, currently right now it only supports Erlang-based event handlers. Um, on the roadmap you'll see I'm planning on supporting other languages. But if you want to do that, this would be how you would do it. Um, oh, one, one thing, these are the exact same. Um, they do the exact same thing. So either you can add an Etsy file, which I like a little bit more, or you can just do export so your, very, so your home, um, so your Beehive can run in different environments and different homes. Um, you can do this one as well. And then do a post, reload the system. It'll reload all the system. It propagates throughout the whole network. Um, and then you're done. And then, then, then you can do that. that. Okay, so let's say um, you wanted to start one in Canada because you're afraid that the US internet might go down and you want to start one in the US because you're afraid that the Canada internet might go down. This is how you would do it. Um, these are short names. You can do this with long names, so you can do it across data centers. You can do it across the world, and it'll look the exact same. Um, oh, and one neat thing is after you do add a second server, Beehive will notice that you added a second server and start moving its, the bees around so that your bees in the US are not too heavy over the ones that are in Canada. I don't know why I like Canada so much as an example. Hmm. Anyway, so let's say we want to change how the bees are chosen. Currently right now, um, it's a random decision on the bees, because that's the one that's baked in by default. But let's say you want to do one that's least loaded, so like a round robin type system. Um, so like, yeah, I'm sorry. So your router is sitting up here, and then you have a whole bunch of bees down here. How do you choose which bee to connect the client to? Right now it's random. So, or actually, I, I, ah, man, these slides are so outdated. I changed it to least loaded. So let's say you want to do random for whatever reason. Um, you could take, um, you, you uh, start beehive with this, with this command, it'll start with um, adding or choosing the bees on a random location if you do this. Um, change how the host name is looked up. This is important because um, Beehive uses the, in your HTTP request, it uses the host header. Let's say you don't want that. Let's say you want to change, um, you, want app, or you want users to be balanced based on the, applica or the application they're using to um, route to the router. So like the user agent, for example, say it like matches something like Mozilla and you want that to see a different application, you could do that. Oh my God, that's so cool! All right, so um, if you if you need more help, um, there's bins in Beehive that will help. There's actually six or seven of them, or something like that. Some of them should go away probably, but um, these two are the ones that will, will never go away. Um, start Beehive, you can see that, and Queen is the um, Queen Bee of the Beehive. Okay, so what's on the roadmap? Um, Beehive Ruby Gem. We have an active developer on it who's working on it right now. Want to automatic automatically scale apps. Currently right now, the scaling is done very dumb. The scaling right now is how many requests are coming in, how many requests you expect. If that exceeds it, scale out a new app. Um, scale down is not dumb. Scale down is like based on time and load, but scaling up is. So that's coming. Um, automatically scale Beehive. So remember I said it was all event driven. So because it is all event driven, we can fire off an event and say, oh my god, I need a new server to run Beehive on then it's say you're running on EC2 and you're watching for that event, you can say, oh, I need a new server. So start up a new EC2 instance, start Beehive over there, and boom, Beehive is, already, is automatically scaled out. Um, that's something that I'm actively working on right now, actually. Um, event handling in other languages, so we, can write, um, so we can write events, like we can watch it for events in other languages, so like Ruby, because that's a lot easier than Erlang. Um, and get a better built-in Beehive dashboard. Oh, I totally forgot. There's a dashboard. <laughs> Look, but it needs to be better. Yeah. But it's a dashboard. 
Okay. <laughs> it does, right? And command line. We could call it B. Yeah. Uh, you want to write it? <laughs> okay. Um, we actually have somebody who's who's like road mapping that out. So hopefully that will be open source soon. That will be a Rack app, I believe. So if you know Rack and you're here, I would assume that you would know at least some Ruby. And Ruby or Rack is allows you to write easy Ruby applications. If you don't know, uh, if you do know, um, welcome to Ruby. <laughs> um, uh, so that will be open source, so you can add to it when you want, or when it goes open source. Um, oh, yeah, uh, working on a built-in Git server. So rather than having to use something like GitHub, uh, Beehive will have its own Git server um, that just uses Git, so we're not re rewriting the wheel. Wait, re-implementing the wheel? Re Inventing the wheel. Um, another uh, thing that we're looking at is ISO bundles rather than tar, so that you can, um, it's a read only file system, so you don't have to deal with any like temp files or whatever. And like, say you don't want your logs to go on the, on the system, if you use an ISO, um, you have to enforce that it will go somewhere else. So Beehive will, fa will um, it will fail to start the application if it can't write to the, you get it. Okay. Um, and better documentation, although there is a lot of documentation, lots of it is out of date, as you saw. Okay, um, more stuff on the roadmap? Ah, we'll see. Um, if you want to get involved, there's the, uh, there's the um, path to the source, there's the Google group that is very inactive, and there is the web page. Now, remember I promised there would be a second one, a second slide that asks for questions. Anyone have any questions now? Awesome. That's like 2,000 times better than last time. I'm going to start over here, because I saw you first. Don't be offended. So um, it looks like this is mainly kind of geared toward, toward web apps. Or if you have like the airline app that's running in the background, you have possibly just use Beehive to just yes. deploy that sucker, build it, yes. get it started. Yes. And um, I said it was extensible. If you can write that in Bash, which I can. I'm an Erlang developer also. Um, I will eventually get that in there that does processing. The, what Beehive really is, um, the way I look at it, is there's a distributed router on top of a bunch of processes that can be, a, that can be connected to by a socket. So you don't have to do, you don't have to have a web app that runs on, a, that runs on like is exposed to the outside world, as long as the way that you want to connect to your app is through um, a, right now, HTTP, um, XMPP is coming-ish, because the developer in Argentina wants to write it, I believe. Um, or actually, there's a developer in Colorado that wants to write that. Or is it Argentina? I don't remember. Anyway, um, the point is, is that um, you, the different protocols, you, um, we can write handlers for different protocols. So as long as you want to connect to it um, using an external socket, then you can use Beehive. And you don't have to even expose it to the outside world. Did I answer the question? Sometimes I go all over the place. All right, you. Wait, what's your name so I can actually say? Austin. Austin. <laughs> really? <laughs> Wow, Austin, are you from Austin? I am. Okay, so that's <laughs> that's awesome, Austin. <laughs> from uh, Austin. <laughs> uh, is the router only running on one node at a time? And if so, what happens if it goes down? No, it's distributed. Okay. So um, that's why I said before I didn't mention, I didn't heavily emphasize how event-driven this is. The event, the events are the distributed part of Beehive. So once an event gets fired off, everyone in the system knows about that event. Um, most specifically, all the routers know about that event because the routers are like the pyramid of Beehive. So um, if that router goes down, all the other, the other supervisors can start it on a different node somewhere else, and you're fine. You don't have to deal with it. I mean, you would want to start another Beehive probably up in Australia or something if both Canada and the U.S. go down, just in case. I mean, your server in Canada and your server in the U.S. <laughs> I'd, yeah, I'm also in Texas, so got to watch it, right? <laughs> any, any other questions? <laughs> um, okay, cool. Thanks. There's my Twitter if you're interested in that. Um, if you're interested in email, there's my email. And if you're interested in my name, there's my name. And if you're interested, awesome. <laughs> Thanks.